All right, my friends, welcome to the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Today, we're just going to follow, do another version of our investments for investing for beginners series. And we're going to talk about stocks, mutual funds, and ETFs, exchange traded funds. I did a pretty thorough, I think, uh, thing on bonds just yesterday. So if you, we're not going to bring in bonds to this discussion, we might talk about it in, in passing, but we're going to avoid bonds for the most part. So this is just stocks. And we're going to talk about the individual stocks. We're going to talk about mutual funds and the relatively new phenomenon called exchange traded funds. So if you like what you see, as always, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. The more subscribers, the more uh, YouTube loves the channel and the more they put out for other people to see. So if it helps you, you know, presumably help other people too. So don't forget to subscribe. All right. So a stock, a stock is an ownership of a company. That's literally what it is. You own a fractional share of a company, a corporation, a, a, a publicly traded company is what a stock is. So you can get on the NAS, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, National Association of Security Dealers Automated Quotation System, I think is what the NASDAQ is. Uh, you can get that NAC, American Stock Exchange, uh, just all these exchanges. And all they do is they say, what's your bid and what's your ask? So if you have a stock that you want to buy, you'll give a bid. You'll say, I'd like to buy that for a dollar. And the, the guy who wants to sell will say, I need a buck oh five. And you have to come to the agreement of what you want. You might have to go back and redo it. Say, I'll give you a buck oh three. The guy says, I'll take it for a buck oh four. And then you have to figure it out from there. It used to be traded, I guess, 20 years ago in eight. So it was like 101 and an eighth, 101 and two eight. I can't remember what it was anymore, but it was a pain because no one really knew what it was. And now they got it. Hey, Mark, what's going on, man? Now they got traded where it's in the, in the pennies, which makes it a lot more efficient. Um, actually, one of the reasons the cost has gone down of trading so much is because it's now in the pennies. And that's good as opposed to eights because you can never see the markups. That's a little bit too much inside baseball. Now, the problem with a stock is anytime you own something, you have a risk of it going kaput, going belly up. You have no assurance whatsoever at all that you will make any money in this. And that's the, it's like if you invest in a restaurant. Yeah, you know, you may make a ton, you may not make any. It just completely depends on the cash flow, the management, the employees they give, someone stealing from. It just depends on so many things with stocks that you have no clue what you're going to get. And this is one thing that bothers me when I see all these people say, I anticipate getting 10% a year. And I say, why? Well, because that's what it's done since 1926. And that's literally the modern era of stock market investing is 1926. Again, going back to one of the books I shared with you the other day, it's on my back behind me. Uh, Jeremy Siegel stocks for the long run. He goes back to 1871, but you can't even use 1800s. You get 1926 is the modern era. And that's right before the Great Depression. And we have the 50s, the ramp up after World War II. Then we have the 73, actually from 19, uh, 1966 to 1982, the market did basically nothing. I mean, in terms of price to price, the stock market, whatever that is, the Dow Jones, we'll use that for example, did nothing. Now, I did get about 2 or 3% a year in dividends, but still the price point from 66 to 82, that's 16 long years, my friends. It did nothing, nothing. And yet inflation was running rampant back then because Nixon, the Bretton Woods, the whole thing. I mean, so we have lots of time periods where the market did not do 10%. It just did not. And so that's why I tell everybody who's a market investor, I said, look, you might not get 10%. You might get 12. You might get five. You might not get 10%. And don't forget, 1926, we're only in 2018. That is not a long term. I, that is not a long term uh, time frame in which to. Uh, all right, right on, man. Bad to, uh, you got it, Mark. Just signed off there. No problem. That is not a long term time frame in terms of analyzing your own retirement that you have. 26 to 1918, that's not even 100 years. What happened in 1926 through 19, uh, 2018? World War II. Remember that? I mean, World War II, the whole European economy was on its back. And the Marshall Plan for the United States was basically the only thing. The U.S. was the only game in town after World War II. Uh, and so when people say, oh, the markets are so good for the U.S. And you look, they might well be. But was there an anomaly for that to happen? I mean, it sounds like I'm being pessimistic. I'm not. I just do believe there are these things called fat tails or black swans that could could devastate you. 1966 and 1982, the markets did literally nothing. 
2000 to 2010, the markets did literally nothing. From 1982 to 1999, the market took off like a bat out of hell. In the 1950s, it is well. So what I mean, these are not tried and true things we can hold our hat on. These are anomalies that happen. And there are just not enough data points to say you can say I can bank on 10 percent a year. We just don't know that. So an individual stock, and particularly, my friends, is the riskiest thing you can have simple, other than a, a naked option. I'm not even going to get into that because this is for beginners. An individual stock is the riskiest thing you can have because you are investing in companies and their management team to know what the hell they're doing. And if they don't know what the hell they're doing, you could lose everything. That is a fact. And then a naked option is even worse because not only could you lose everything, but there's an unlimited upside loss that you could have, which is why I don't advocate getting involved in options. The unlimited upside loss is mind boggling on options. I don't think a lot of people recognize the risk there, but in stock, at least Wi-Fi. Try again. Am I on here? All right. So I think I'm back. All right. I think I'm back. So a, uh, it looks like I was moving there. All right. So I'll uh, adjust this as we go forward. But anyway, if, if you're out there and you see that I'm back, thumbs up would be helpful for sure. All right. So anyway, uh, a stock, at least, you know, if you buy 100 shares for a buck, you have $100. The worst case scenario would be you lose 100 bucks. That's it. You know for a fact what your worst case. All right. Thanks. Thank you, man. You know for a fact what your worst case scenario is going to be. It's going to be $100. That's the nice thing about stocks. You know what it's going to be. On top of that, you say at the end of the day, if we have earnings of 6% year over year and dividends of 4 over percent year over year, I expect to get a 10% return on my money, on my capital, or return on investment. Stocks are uh, just, if you look historically, the way stocks are attributed in terms of growth is dividends plus earnings. Earnings growth year over year. 6% historically, dividends that you pay, 4% historically. Right now, dividends are about 2 and earnings growth anywhere between 5 to 6 I mean, we have some good GDP numbers for the last two quarters. I, we don't know if that's going to be – we don't know if that's sustainable. We just don't know. But if the dividends are only half of what they were, we need earnings growth to be 8% year over year just to give you your 10% rates of return. I don't think there's anyone out there saying we expect the S&P 500 to give us earnings growth of year over year of 8%. I mean, that's it would be wonderful that were to happen. I, I don't think any prognosticators are thinking that. So with dividends at half price, what they've been, unless we get significant earnings growth, it's just I don't see how you can say that the stock market, the U.S. market is going to give you a 10 percent rate of return. I just don't. And it's just I mean, it could. But then you get a factor in two. A lot of people say, well, the prices could go up. Well, prices are based on earnings. I mean, it's a price to earnings ratio. If you have a stock that's trading at ten dollars a share. And for every, it makes $1 of earnings. The PE ratio is 10, all right? So that means you're paying $10 for that $1 of earnings. If you have a stock that trades at $20 a share and it has a PE of earnings, it has $1 of earnings, you're paying $20 of, 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 of you're paying 20 bucks that $1 of earnings. And inherently the $20 that you're paying for that $1 of earnings is a lot more expensive than the 10. And there might be a reason for that. Maybe they got like Apple is just a thousand billion million dollars of cash on the side. Maybe their growth projections are through the roof like Amazon. I, and I don't know what I'm not saying that. But at the end of the day, historical P.E. ratios in the U.S. stock market, the S&P 500 has been about 15 to 16, 15 and a half roughly. And we're not there. We're a little bit above that. And so to get a significant price appreciation, uh, we're going to have to have significant earnings. And I'm not, I, where is that going to come from? Because it's not come from dividends. It's going to have to come from significant earnings. Now, it could happen. I mean, maybe the Trump tax cut will kick butt and take names. And we're starting to see a little bit of that for sure. Unemployment is low. I get all that. But at the end of the day, the company's got to make earnings. They got to make earnings to keep the prices high and to keep the prices to go even higher. And just as we sit here today, you should not bank. that. That's going to happen. You just shouldn't. I mean, if you can get it, it's wonderful, but don't project 10%. I'm just telling you, don't do this projection of 10%. Not with dividends at 2%, not with the price to earnings ratios the way they are, because they're not low. In 1982, the PE ratios are about eight. So you could have bought a stock in 1982, paid $8 for every dollar of earnings, which is incredibly cheap. 
That is when Business Week said this death of equities. That's when no one in the world wanted to touch stocks with a 10-foot pole. On top of that, that was when the 30-year long bond, the treasury bond, you could have bought and get a 15 and a quarter percent yield. So if I get 15 and a quarter and I'm getting, let's just say, a 6% dividend on stocks, the 15 and a quarter government bond is guaranteed never to go bankrupt. Now, I might not make any money because inflation can keep it alive, but I know I'm going to get my principal back. And I know I'm going to get 15 and a quarter year over year for the next 30 years. With stocks, though, I'm getting 6% dividend and they could go bankrupt. Who? I mean, the people who bought in 1982 are, are happy campers, but it's not that easy to do. When the P.E. ratios are low, that is when the buying time is there. But the P.E. ratios maybe hey, what's going on, CB? That, hey, what's up, brother? That might that might mean P.E. ratios are low for a reason, That because the stock is out of favor, because a company looks like it's on its back. I, I don't know what it is, but that's not where we are today. We are not with low P.E. ratios. We have low dividends, higher than normal P.E. ratios. And even if growth earnings is 6% a year, which it seems to be on the high end, where are you going to get the the ten the ten percent year over year growth? Just uh, year over year rates of return. It's just, it's just not going to be there, and so that's a concern I have. Now people say, well, you look at the the ten year Treasury bond is yielding you know two point nine something like that. Historically, it's been about five and a half to six. So we do these inversions and stuff like that, and and, and I get all that. But at the end of the day, for a stock market return, an individual stock year over year earnings growth plus dividends. If you factor those two things, you combine them, that's what your rate of return would be. That's what you project for your rates of return going forward. And if you can convince yourself that the earnings growth year over year is going to be 9, 10, 11 percent, you can make your projections to look wonderful. And I'm not saying don't do it. I just don't see where it's going to come from. You know, so let's talk about a company like Amazon. I think Amazon, and I use Amazon all the time. Uh, Amazon is wonderful. I like. I, look, Amazon changed the world. Bezos, you know, love him or hate him, he's it just he's changed the world. And you know, more power to him. It's capitalism, one hundred percent, and I like it. Uh, the problem with Amazon, though, is they haven't made the earnings that uh, that just aren't there. That doesn't mean they won't. But as you sit here right now, you're paying like last I checked a couple weeks ago, it was like two hundred fifty dollars for one dollar of earnings. So when you think about that, I mean, if they're 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 trading a sky high. The price to earnings ratio. That means their earnings growth has literally got to go on a trajectory like this. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just like, man, you are buying it at a high, high price without question, without question. Where is that earnings growth going to come from? That's the first thing you have to ask, because at some point, there's a greater fool theory in economics. Who is going to end up holding the wet bag? The wet bag is always a tulip mania. And I'm not saying Amazon's tulip mania. My goodness, it's a real company, employs real people. I get that. But at the end of the day, I mean, when you're pay paying a $250 for $1 of earnings, where, where are we going to get the increase the price appreciation? I mean, where is that going to come from? I, I mean, if they doubled their earnings, you're still paying 125 PE ratio. And they're, no one's saying they're – and that's just not their – that's their profits. I mean, who uh, – I don't get it. I, I mean, that's the thing. As you sit and you look at these valuations, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. Where is the profitability going to come from? A doubling of their earnings, profits is what that is. Net <laughs> means their PE ratio is still one twenty five. Now I will say, uh, about two years ago, Amazon was at nine ninety nine or something like that. It was at a th they had a they had their first profitable quarter, and I remember reading an analyst who didn't like that because they said it showed now how <laughs> how high the PE ratio was. They'd be like twenty four cents a quarter or something like that. And their PE ratio is like over a thousand, and the analysts didn't want that. They'd rather have them losing money. So you didn't know what their PE ratio was because that PE you have to have earnings, and earnings are positive, <laughs> positive rates of return. Ah, I thought that's fine. So I will give them credit. It was a thousand, now it's two fifty. In theory, it could go down to ten. Who knows what it could go down to? But that's what a stock can do. You're buying it at a PE ratio at either two hundred and fifty, and you're thinking it's going to get some. You know, hell bent for leather growth on there, and you're gonna make out like a bandit because that growth just grows and grows and grows, and your stock price does, or it's gonna pay a heck of a lot of dividends. And Amazon's not gonna pay any dividends, so you're banking on major, massive growth to the like we've never seen, frankly. And again, if you want to buy it, more power to you. I, I frankly don't care, but I'm just saying that's one of the issues when it comes to individual stocks. On the counter to that is you could buy a stock that's I don't know what what's something that's in the news. I don't know, Sears, uh, Sears of bankrupt. But, you know, these I was just reading about one just the other day. I'm drawing a blank what it was. And let's say it, has a, it was a, 
you know, eight PA going back and eight price to earnings ratio. So you're trading a major, major value in terms of the earnings that it makes and the price that it commands. An eight PE ratio, you're eight above earnings. As a, and today it's even lower because the average PE on the S&P 500 is about 15, 16. I guess right now it's about 17 and a half or so, depending on what dates you're looking at. So you yeah, you know, whatever it is. Um, buying a stock has a PE ratio of a PE ratio of eight. I was just looking at stock for this client of mine the other day, and I think I said in one of my videos she had seventy percent of her assets in this one stock, and she's had it for a long time. Her dad died; she inherited it. His dad died; uh, her dad owned it from like nineteen sixty, and it's just getting a dividend each and every year going back. But then you look at the financials. And you see a huge increase in debt. So debt, 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 like that. And you're like, whoa, what's going on? And then you see a decrease year over year in profitability and cash flow. And you do not see the, the decrease in the dividend is paying. All right. And so that tells me that they, <laughs> that they are losing money relative to where before. They're still profitable, but they have the low PE. That's another thing, too. They had a low PE. So it might seem profitable. But they're losing money, cash flow, taking on more debt in order to keep that dividend up there because they know this is an old fashioned blue chip stock. If the dividend gets cut, that share price is going to drop like a freaking brick and water. You can see that a mile away. A dividend, the biggest thing that concerns investors is when you cut the dividend, people are like, whoa, what the heck is going on? And that makes people nervous as can be. And so now if I'm taking on debt, they, they, take debt to fund a dividend because my cash flow is declining right in front of my very eyes. That's bad news. I mean, there might again be a reason, but if you look at the financials and year over year, we're seeing a decline in earnings, a decline in profitability, a huge decline in cash. And then all of a sudden I know they get big and full cash. You're like, whoa, what's that about? And you look at their debt on the balance sheet, look at the debt side of the balance sheet. And you're like, whoa, I see. They issue three billion dollars in bonds, and it, there's no other way around that. They're going to use that cash to fund the dividend. You can see that a mile away, and that might give them some some time to hang in there for a little bit. But what happens when I just what happens unless they get the the ship righted? You know, they're going to keep going down and down and down. It's almost like borrowing to pay off a credit card. At some point, it's all going to come back and bite you in the butt. Borrowing to pay off a credit card, you don't do. Borrowing to pay a dividend, it, it just at some point it's going to come back and bite you. And you just can't have that. So that's how stocks work. Now, I do want to talk about mutual funds. Mutual funds are simply, my friends, a you own a fractional share of a bunch of different companies. All right, let's just say the S and P five hundred index, so VFINX from Vanguard, VFINX. You own, I think it's trading. I don't even know what's trading now. Let's say hundred bucks a share. You own 10,000 shares of it. So whatever 10,000 times 100 is, I think it's 100,000. So you own $100,000 um, worth of Vanguard S&P 500. You literally own an eighth of, of one of 10 million percent of Apple or something like that. You have no say in how that is company is going to be run. So you'll get all these proxies, throw them away. Your vote means nothing because you literally own fractional proportion of this fund. That's it. And that's how a mutual fund works and an exchange traded fund as well. You own a fractional position, such a small position. Your vote, they don't know who you are. Your vote is meaningless. So when you get these proxies every six months or so, toss in the trash. Don't call up the broker. Don't call up the fund companies. They vote by, they just don't care. They, I mean, I'm telling you, you get these proxies all the time and say, oh, we're going to get a new you know, chairman of the board for, I don't know, dealing with China. What do you think about it? I don't care because you don't care what I think because I have no voting rights. So it's just, it doesn't, I mean, you do, but it won't matter. So that's how mutual funds work. You own a portion, proportional share of a bunch of different companies. And the reason why mutual funds are good is because you're spreading your risk out wide. When you own an individual stock, you're, you're concentrated. And I'll give you an example. I had a client this back when I was in Philadelphia, the nicest couple you'll ever meet from Alabama. Husband wanted to buy TWA, Transworld Airlines, in like the late 60s or early 70s. Wife wanted to buy McDonald's. They went with the husband's recommendation, bought TWA. 
TWA, my granddad was a pilot for him and they went kaput. And we know where the story of McDonald's is. Love him or hate him. The facts are McDonald's has made a lot of people a lot of money. And when I was dealing with them, the wife actually got me because we all had a good chuckle because they're just wonderful, wonderful people, salt of the people. But she got me a $50 gift card to McDonald's to celebrate her lack of success and convincing her husband as a stock investor. And that was, that was pretty cute. I liked that quite a bit. And then uh, later on, husband had no say in investing in individual stocks. That's the issue. Who knew TWA would go kaput? Who knew McDonald's would be what it was? It's a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot, my friends. You just don't know. It's luck. I, there is no skill. Uh, theoretically, the people say, well, how about Warren Buffett? Uh, you aren't Warren Buffett. I'm not Warren Buffett. When it comes to stocks, the vast majority of time is luck. That's why you spread your risk over many different companies to avoid being taken to the cleaner, which also means you're going to avoid making that you know, triple, quadruple, million bagger like Apple did. Now, remember, too, in Apple in 1998 or seven, uh, what's his name? Jobs went to Bill Gates on his knees begging for money because Apple was trading at seven dollars a share. Seven bucks. No one thought Apple was going to survive back then. So talk about a P.E. ratio that's low. I don't even know what it was back then. That's the 98. I was working at Vanguard. I remember no one wanted to touch Apple with a 10 foot pole. Bill Gates loaned the money and the rest is history. Apple is now almost a trillion dollar market cap. You could have bought that puppy in 1998. Was it I think it was 98 for seven bucks a share. Who was doing that though? Only the people of actively risk takers. Cause a lot of people said there's a reason why Apple is trading so low. That sucker is going to go belly up and they didn't. But for every Apple, there's a pets.com that did go belly up when it starts shrinking, shrinking like that it happens all the time. You just don't know. You just don't know. So spread your risk. Draw back again, spreading your risk. You're never going to hit that grand slam home run, but you're never really going to get killed either when it turn, comes the time to losing all your money. You're not going to lose it. You might lose 45% like we did in 2007 or 2009, but you're never going to lose everything. I hate to say never. You probably won't lose everything. We just don't know. So that's what a mutual fund does. Now, there is something called active share. All right, what active share simply means is you're saying, OK, I'm going to invest in mutual funds, but I want it to be a little bit more concentrated than just a large you know, conglomerate of different things. And there is some studies that, that say active share has a tendency potentially to outperform a just a just basically a huge holding of a bunch of different stocks. Active share just simply means I'm going to buy a mutual fund that only has 50 companies. So it's very highly concentrated. Now, if those 50 companies are in one you know, sector of the economy, technology or something like that, and technology just happens to kick butt and take names, your fund will probably outperform. That's just how it works. You're taking a concentrated risk, not on one company, but on a segment of the companies or of, the, of a sector, if you will, technology in this case, or oil, whatever it is going to be. And there is some validity that says active share can outperform this. Now we're talking about mutual funds because I'm concentrating on this one segment of the market. So if you have a firm belief in fracking, uh, for instance, you say, I really think oil refineries or whatever it is you're trying to do, or uh, what Jack, what do they call them? The guys out there who are picking up oil in Texas. I forgot what, uh, wildcatters. There's some opportunity for wildcatters to make a lot of money. I want to invest in that segment, but I don't want to put it all in one wildcat or company. That might prove to be profitable. Again, it could prove to your detriment too, but that is what's called active share. I'm going to take an active approach to this one sector or this one thought process on how the markets work. So again, an active share simply means S&P 500 has 500 stocks. I'm going to invest in a mutual fund that only has 50. That means I have an active share of 90%. Because I have 500 as S&P 500, I have 50 in my fund. That means 450 I don't have. And if you take 500, divide that by uh, 50, divide that by 500, it's kind of complex, but it gives you 90%. That's what that means. You have a 90% active share. And there are some studies that say active share is a good way to predict um, potential outperformance of the, of the broad market. And I actually, I kind of subscribe to that. And I do simply because I think, again, concentration is your opportunity. Concentration could be your death now, but it is your opportunity as well. Now, with the drawback of mutual funds, they only trade once a day. 
So you got to get your order in before 4 p.m. All right. If you don't get your order in before 4 p.m., the, the, the next day trading is when it's going to trade. So if you get your order in at 402, you're not getting today's price. You're getting tomorrow's price. And you have no clue what it's going to be. So if you're after four, don't put a trade in. Just wait till the following day. And you can nice thing with mutual funds, too, is you can say 10 o'clock and say you just woke up and you're in a grumpy mood. You say, I'm going to put a trade to sell this stupid Vanguard Windsor 2 fund because I can't stand the guy running it. And then later on down the day, say, I woke up in a better mood. I, I was hangry and I just ate a good, you know, uh, some chimichangas from Papacitos there in San Antonio. You're feeling good. You feel good. You can you can take away that that order to sell because it hasn't executed yet. A mutual fund executes once a day. So you can go put a buy order, sell order, buy order, sell order. Nothing matters. The only thing that matters is what is the order that you have at 4 p.m. that afternoon. That is what will execute. So that's a nice thing about funds. You can actually put an execute an order in early in the morning, late. You can do whatever you want. As long as it's, if it's not there at 4 p.m., nothing will happen. ETFs. Now, this is the last thing we'll talk about here today. ETFs are a little bit different. Um, again, a relatively new phenomenon. I think it was just, man, it was like 50. They didn't have bond ETFs until about 15 years ago. It's interesting, actually. Uh, John Bogle from Vanguard is not a big fan of ETF. John Bogle thinks even he doesn't like what Vanguard is doing. It was going on PD. Uh, Bogle does not like ETFs because he says it encourages bad investment behavior, which is market timing, active trading when ETF should be, I mean, when investing should be holding it for the long term. Bogle says, no, people aren't doing that with ETFs. It's encouraging short-term trading. And the reason why is because unlike mutual funds, ETFs trade throughout the day. There's typically going to be a three-letter ticker on an ETF. VWO is a Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF, for instance. So it was a market open at 930 to 4. So you can trade that puppy all day long. In fact, I think Fidelity now offers commission-free ETFs as a Schwab of those companies. So you can trade literally all day long. You can say try, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. I don't know if you can do options on ETFs. Um, I, I can't remember. I'm, you can probably even do options on ETFs. I, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, ETFs, you can trade that puppy back and forth, back and forth. You can do all kinds of stuff that you want with ETFs, which means if you wake up grumpy at 10 o'clock and you don't like the guy who uh, you saw on CNBC, you put an order in right now, that puppy will be executed right there if it's a market order. Market order just means I'm telling the market, I'll take the, the price that I can get and I'll be done with it. That's what a market order is. I'm not putting any limitations on my price. I'm saying at the end of the day, I'm just putting it out there and whatever the, the guy wants to buy it from me or whatever the guy wants to sell it from me, that's what he or she is going to pay. And I'm happy with that. That's called a market order. So an ETF, because it is it trades all the time. Because there's a volume on it each and every moment of each every day, you can make unlimited trades. Now, you probably ought not to, but you could. In a mutual fund, you can't. There is no volume on a mutual fund. It's just a trades once a day. So an ETF has a little bit more liquidity. I frankly don't buy that, uh, that you need liquidity of ETFs. I, I, I just, I'm not a big fan necessarily. ETFs are a lot more tax efficient, frankly, but I'm not going to get that here today. But I do think some people say, ETFs, oh, yeah, Bogle. Yeah, he, yeah, that's what my man CB says. Uh, uh, ETFs encourages trading. Yep, I agree. I agree 100%. And, and active trading is not the way to success in the investment market. It's just not. Now, I do like ETFs because you can define a sector of the economy. You can really slice and dice. And ETFs, the nice thing is a lot of people think ETFs are low cost. And by and large, they are. Not all of them are. Just because it says exchange traded fund doesn't mean it's cheap. Please understand that there are ETFs that are not cheap. Kind of like index funds, for heaven forbid, if you buy an index fund with a 50 or 75 basis point fee, just stop, 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 stop. There's absolutely no reason to pay act just that kind of price for, for an index fund. Uh, just ah, somebody's just ignorance of the investor. And yet there will be people who are willing to separate with low cost. What's synonymous with low cost would be Vanguard or Schwab. Or again, I don't know all that much about Fidelity ETS. I'm frankly hesitant because. I know Fidelity, the Johnson family owns them. Uh, my man Bogle, <laughs> he ripped. Oh, man, I wish I could find that YouTube video Bogle ripping into the Johnson family because uh, it was awesome. Yeah, he would hold no punches. I just I can't find it. One of these guys on my YouTube channel asked me to find the link. And if anyone out there, CB, if anyone knows the uh, YouTube video of John Bogle ripping into the Johnson family who owns Fidelity, I would love that link because that 
man, I'd put that. Uh, that one's fantastic. But anyway, so just at the end of the day, because it's an exchange traded fund does not mean it's cheap. It probably is, but by and large, uh, they will be, but it doesn't mean they are all the time. Mutual funds typically have five letters for their tickers. Individual stocks can have anything from one to three generally. Like I think AT&T was T. I don't know if it still is anymore. Uh, Ford was F. Uh, then you have things like Microsoft MSFT. Microsoft is on the NASDAQ. So generally speaking, if it's four letters, that means it's on the NASDAQ. If it's three or less, that means it's on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, for To be on the New York Stock Exchange generally means it's a little bit more of a blue chip stock, has a little bit more chops, I guess. And companies will do whatever they can to stay listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm just telling you right now, if it looks like a company is about to be delisted, they'll scare them to death. That means they'll start buying back shares. They'll start doing anything, increasing dividends, anything to get the share price. I think it used to be above five dollars a share. I don't know what it is anymore, but they cannot. They do not want to be delisted. They think that's a uh, that would lose legitimacy. And, and there's some. They're probably right in that regard. So again, five letters would be a mutual fund. Three letters is typically an ETF. I have seen some four Vanguard's got some four. Uh, three or less is typically a blue chip stock in the New York Stock Exchange. That's how that's how that works. Uh, individual stocks, you always want to, in my opinion, buy in round lots, so 100 shares. So you don't buy 33 shares, generally speaking. The reason why you want to buy in round lots is on individual stocks. I got 100 shares of at t Because when it pays dividends and it reinvests, you want to know how many more shares you've received for your initial investment. It's just something that's nice about that. You say, I know I had 100 shares of this. I remember I bought it at 24 and with 24 times 100, you can figure that out. Now I got 103.85 shares and whatever the price is at that point. So you know you got 3.85 that you've earned from dividend reinvesting. And there's something neat about having that. And when you can buy in a round lot, that's what that's called. 100 shares is a round lot. An odd lot, 65, 50, 52.5. It's just harder to track. And the reason I suggest that, too, is because when you're looking at your account online, it actually drives up the wall. Every single firm I've ever seen, I'm sure there's some that don't do this. If it's an IRA, they're going to say uh, every time there's a dividend, they're going to include include that to increase your cost basis. So if you buy a stock for a thousand bucks and you get a hundred dollar dividend, It'll say your cost basis is eleven hundred dollars, all right, and that means theoretically that's the value. Your that's what you you could get back tax free without paying tax on. I buy for a hundred, I get a hundred dollar dividend. I got to pay tax on a hundred dollar dividend, so now my cost basis is eleven hundred bucks. If I turn around, and I sell the stock for a thousand fifty. So initially, I bought it for a hundred for a thousand. I got a hundred dollar dividend, and I'm selling it for a thousand fifty. I still made fifty bucks. But what happened on the reporting tool online is they'll say, oh, if you lost 50 bucks and you're like, whoa, 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 I didn't lose 50 bucks. I made up 50 bucks. They said, no, because you had to pay tax on the dividend, the hundred dollar dividend that you got. They're like, but it's an IRA. I don't pay any tax on hundred dollar dividend and not until I pull it out. And I don't even pay tax on dividend. I pay on the whole thing. It just it's I, I, I cannot tell you how many people have made horrible mistakes when it comes to investing by not understanding their true cost basis. And then they're assuming they haven't made any money. And I'm like, you've made money. You started with 10,000 bucks. The thing's worth $15,000. You made $5,000, i.e. you've made 50% return. They're like, no, my computer showed me I've, I've lost $3,000. I said, because you've had $8,000 of dividend reinvestment. You bought it for 10, you had $8,000. So this $18,000 is what the computer thinks your cost basis should be. But it's an IRA. It doesn't matter what the computer thinks. And if you sell it for 15, you haven't lost 3,000. You've made 5,000 because that is your initial cost basis. So going, what's the point about this round lots? Round lots, again, for individual stocks, we'll say very explicitly, you had 100 shares when you bought it. Everything else is relevant. I had 100 shares. Ideally, you'll be able to know what you bought it at, 24 bucks a share. And the new reporting mechanisms from, uh, I think Obama's uh, did in 2011, I think it was actually Bush, in 2011 and 12, they now require custodians to give you your, your true cost basis per lot. And what that means is every time there's a dividend, every time anything, which is kind of confusing, but still kind of cool. But still, I like round lots for individual shares. That means 100 shares of AT&T, 100 shares of Ford, whatever it is you want to buy, a nice round lot. Um, and then you'll get dividend reinvestments. Inherently, those will not be round lots. Those will be fractional shares, 3.65 shares. 
Um, and then with mutual funds, it doesn't matter. Mutual funds, you just say how much you want to pay. I want to buy this for a thousand bucks, a hundred thousand bucks, because you don't know what the order is going to be. You have no deal idea what the price is going to be with a mutual fund because it only trades at once a day. You literally have no idea, none. Um, with ETS, because it trades every single second of every single uh, day when the market is open, again, you're, you'd are you still want round loss there too. 100 shares or an ETF, 50 shares if it's trading pretty high, something like that. But it, that's 50 shares is still an odd lot. You want round lots if, if you can, if you have the price, if you can afford that. Um, see, oh, last thing. All right, this last thing, and then we'll be done with this. Whatever you do, if you're buying an individual stock, do not put an open order in the night before. Uh, that what that means is you're saying at the end of the day is what what time is it right now? Seven something, seven oh four here in Georgia. That means I want to buy a hundred shares of AT and T because it looks like that's a good buy. And I it's the market's closed. I won't execute today. It'll execute at first opening tomorrow. But I have no clue what's going to happen in after markets trading. None whatsoever. So if I put in uh, in the Ian Ellis LLC stocks, <laughs> I don't know who that is, but if I put an open order in tonight and then all of a sudden something goes crazy and ATT now trades at $500,000, million, I am on the hook for that puppy being executed when it opens tomorrow. Does that make sense? You put an open order in, that just simply means it will execute at the first opportunity the next day, regardless of price. This happened to your old buddy Josh in 1999 or 1998. I put an open order for Yahoo or was it CMGI? I can't remember. One of those tech companies, I think it might have been CMGI. And I got hammered because they had positive earnings. I can't remember. Came into work the next day, and that puppy traded, I think it was like 20% higher than my open order was. And I was a trader with Schwab back then. I was on the, I should have known better. I just didn't even think about it. I said, okay, yeah, I like the CMGI, 100 shares at, it was 10, I don't know what it was, 10. Coming the next day, that puppy executed at 13 or something like that. I can't remember. It was like 30% higher than what I did. Don't ever put an open order in the night before. Just wait until you can see what happens. Go online go at 9, 9, I think the market is open at 9, 30. Go online at 9, 9, 15, and then put your open order in there. Now, what you want to do, you want to put a stop or a lot, all kinds of different mechanisms. You just don't want open order, market execution. You want some kind of position where you say, at the end of the day, I don't want to put any more into this than 70 bucks a share or something like that. Uh, Frank, you can do that. And that makes sense. At the end of the day, I like open orders. I just don't want you to do that the night before. You do not say here today and say, I'm going to put my cell phone, go on my Schwab site, put an open order for $10,000 worth of XYZ stock. And then I'm going to go to bed sleeping like a baby. Next thing you know, you, you wake up the next day and you forgot what you've done. And now all of a sudden that thing trades at 20, 25, 30% higher than what you did because they had some positive earnings results in Japan or something like that. You are on the hook for that. You are. You owe that. You got to come up with it. And that's that's bad. All right. That's all I want to say. Stocks are riskier. I didn't talk about bonds. I think I talked about bonds in depth yesterday. I like stocks. I do not like bonds, as you can probably attest to. I believe in capitalism. I believe the, the economy is doing pretty well. And I don't just say it's Trump or Obama. I think at the end of the day, the American ingenuity of changing things with technology. And think about this. And it gets a little bit of rant here. 20 years ago, there's no such thing as search engine optimization. There's no economics, uh, economics, economists out there said, we identified this new career called search engine optimization or advertising affiliates using Facebook. There's no one out there doing that. As much as you might hate Facebook and Google and all that, I, I, hey, fine. But the facts are they have changed the world as we know it for sure. No one was out there saying Facebook or Google search engine optimization, Facebook ad, ad agencies, what I'm doing right here. There was no one doing that. And yet all the economists out there are saying, well, we are our prognostications. Are, and it's like, what the hell? Yeah, they don't know any more than you or I. And that's what makes it wonderful because you're sitting out the other day. People are going to lose their shirts. They're going to win. They're going to lose. They're going to win. It's called creative destruction. And that's an old economics term. The old days, like we're going to create to create, but we have to destroy. So the newspaper industry is being destroyed. I actually run an ad locally. I didn't get any traffic on my website when I ran this ad in my local rag. I put a $10 a day ad on Facebook. I got tons of traffic. It's, it's just, it's just, it's amazing. 
And it's creative destruction. We created opportunity to reach you guys that weren't there before. We destroyed the local newspaper industry and rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter. It's happening right before your eyes. The point about that is that's why I believe that stocks have beneficial results because there will be new Facebooks, new Googles out there. We don't know what they're going to be at this stage. We have not, it will be AI. You know, I'd never bought into electric vehicles the way you know that Elon Musk uh, guys have. I, I I love a hybrid, frankly, because I do believe having two sources, gasoline and battery power. I like that, but um, but we don't know. I mean, who's going to come up with a new tech? I have no idea. But it's wonderful, and someone's going to. And that guy or lady is going to make a lot of money and would be nice to be part of that as an owner of that firm. That's what capitalism, the markets do. You own something, but because you own it, you could also lose everything, too. So spread your risk. Don't just own one thing. Spread your risk among many different companies. Buy those puppies. Contribute every month, 250 200 bucks a month. You, you can be just a, I'm a poor kid from Peaks Island, Maine. I, uh, I'll show, let me show you something here real quick. This is what I was raised on right here. This is an old fashioned one dollar food stamp. All right, we had purple for five dollars. I think it was orange for ten. I remember these from my mom, still these from my mom, and take them down to the store on Main. It's called Feeney's Market. You buy a piece of gum, and because there was no, they'd have to give you change back in quarters and dimes and whatnot. And then you'd use that and go play the arcade games. And that, I mean, that's what I, that's what I lived on. Just some food stamps. And you probably have a story similar to that. But here I am doing this. That's what makes it great. It's capitalism, man. You say, hey, at the end of the day, you work hard. You put your dues in and you learn. And you, you, you can just be some schmuck like me and, and live a pretty good life. It's wonderful. 250 bucks a month into an account. Just diversify it across the board. Keep your fees low. And there's nothing stopping you. There's nothing. It's wonderful. Then you hit 55 or 60. You say, I don't want to say it, but you have a certain kind of money. Well, we say F you money. And you say, I'm out of here. That's great. You say, I don't I don't need to, to take orders from these people anymore. I can do my own thing. And we call it F you money. I'll let you figure out what the F you stands for. Once you reach that, uh, it's wonderful. And you can do it. You don't have to be some MIT computer science grad or Harvard you know, literature guy. You just be some regular dude. You don't have to go to college. Anyway. All right, my friends. Well, I appreciate you being here. Sorry for my rambling, but uh, I enjoyed immensely. And uh, again, stocks, in my opinion, diversify stock mutual funds or ETFs. I just like broad-based index funds and you'll be done. Contribute, contribute, contribute. When the markets fall, which they will, always they do. Don't go panicking. And if you are going to buy individual stocks, recognize you could hit a grand slam or you can strike out with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth at Fenway Park with Mario Rivera on the mound. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, or you could be Bucky Dent. Hit that home run to put the Red Sox out in 1978. You could be Bucky Dent as well. Um, stream, I don't, a stream schedule. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that means. Like, where well, I do this on a regular basis, uh, damn surfer. <laughs> um, so the... Okay, I, I don't. Is I, that actually might not be a bad idea? And what do you think? I'd, you know, you think that'd be something that'd be a good idea to just say every, I don't know, every day or every couple of days do something like this on a regular basis. You think that'd be interesting? Um, I thought about doing a live one every morning, but I, I don't like the morning so much. Um, generally speaking, I'm not okay. Yeah, I think about doing something live. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see this, but uh, this guy says you should do a stream thing on a regular basis. That's probably not a bad idea. I think about doing one a day. My question was, should I do it uh, right on? Uh, should I do it at the morning or at night? So um, anyway, if you want to put comments on there, I'd love to hear it, man, for sure. Put comments on there. The thing about being self-employed, just a real quick, um, I'm using my retirement money right now to do this. All right. So everyone's like, oh, you should save for retirement. And we had another guy on my channel who commented. I loved it. He said, no, he retired and he had a great last 10 years. And he knows if he has to go back to work, he'll do it. But it, I just life's too short. I just know way, way, way too many people have died way too early. And I'm not going to let that happen. And so I said at the end of the day, I didn't quite have enough FU money, but I had enough where I could say at the end of the day, I can make a go out of my business, which is just doing this stuff. Man, I love it. It's freaking awesome. It's liberating as all can be. And if I run out of money, like I don't, man, I used to be in the infantry. I'll go dig ditches for a living. I don't care. But at least I can say I tried. And you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have debt, and I have debt, I got this mortgage behind me. But you know, once my kids are out of school, um, 
Lynette Zhang, not familiar with her, Valerie. Who's uh, who's that? And I don't know. Is that someone I should uh, should look at? But anyway, uh, as Valerie's responding there, if you have uh, – if don't wait until you're 65 years old and now you got arthritis and you got diabetes before you retire. And not, not retire like sitting on there and smoking cigars on the front porch. I mean, just do what you want to do. It's the, man, it's the best thing that I've ever done by far. And if I don't make it, I'll go back and do some crappy old job. But at least I say I gave it a shot and I'll be uh, I'm blessed to be able to do that. And I wish you could do that, too. And you can do it if you don't have debt. I'm telling you right now, if you don't have debt, you'll be amazed at how little money you spend. I really do believe that. All right. So uh, Valerie D says uh, Lynette Zhang is someone to watch. I'm not familiar with her, but I will check her out for sure. So uh, I don't know who that person is, but uh, I'll definitely give her a go. All right, my friends, well, I'm done. So if you have any questions, thoughts, I'd love to comments that below. It's been, I, I'm blessed. I, I humbled uh, that you guys are watching me. This is just amazing. It's cool. So hey, thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. She talks about currency reset.